the Salisbury Independent, D3, and 47 ABC WMDT Television. Please join me in a round of applause to recognize their commitment. I want to welcome a few special guests we have with us here uh, this afternoon. Uh, the great president of uh, Warwick College, Ray Boy, is here. Thank you very much. Our partner in uh, all that is good and will continue to get better here in our region, uh, the President and CEO of the Greater Salisbury Committee, Mike Dunn. Michael, thank you. And make sure you come to the basketball tournament here in this beautiful facility after Christmas. It is an amazing event, great basketball. Even if you're not a basketball fan, it's a lot of fun. And we have our director of our Concord County Parks and Tourism, Steve Miller, with us. Thank you, Steve. A couple of important events coming up, then we have a couple spotlight speakers and then our guest keynote speaker. Uh, I want to draw your attention to uh, the 29th of November, the next installment in our VIP dinner series will be at SU, the Scarborough University Leadership Center. It's a wonderful evening. Our speaker is Renee Winsky. She's the president of Leadership Maryland, and she's the former executive director of TEDCO. And that's a great evening. It's a cocktail hour, a beautiful dinner, and it's an intimate setting. There's only 40 tickets available for this. We still have some left. You can get all of that information and get your tickets online. In December, uh, one of the big key events here uh, in southern Delmarva is the economic forecast. That's December 7th. That's also at Salisbury University. We're doing the same format that we did last year. We're going to have a series of rapid-fire speakers, topics ranging from uh, offshore wind to higher ed to our public school system here. We'll have a speaker from Wallops that will be there. We have six economic development directors that will be with us, the four from the Lower Shore, and we've included uh, Sussex County, Delaware, and Accomack County, Virginia, because we are linked with those communities and those business communities as well. That's 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. The luncheon, again, will feature the our delegation, the Lower Shore delegation, and we'll uh, be asking them some tough questions about the General Assembly session that will be commencing in just a few weeks uh, following this event on December 7th. In January, at our general membership luncheon on the 17th, this is a really important luncheon to attend if you can't send somebody. Larry Richardson, who's the Vice President of Government Affairs for the Maryland Chamber of Commerce, will be our speaker, and he's going to run through all the pre-filed bills and all the bills that are likely to come back uh, in the 19th session that are potentially impactful on the business community. Um, Larry's a smart man, an expert. I know Mary knows who I'm talking about, Larry Richardson. But he'll be there as our speaker. It's important that you have representation there because there are some very heinous pieces of legislation that will be introduced in 19, among them uh, raising of the minimum wage, which would have a horrible impact on small businesses here, especially on the Eastern Shore. Predictive scheduling, which would be a requirement for all employers. It's an ugly piece of legislation. It'll rear its head again. And there are going to be some tweaks, potentially good and bad, to the already existing mandatory leave law. So it's important to have somebody there. And another equally important event is our second annual State of the Lycoming County Public Schools on the 28th at Parkside High School. Uh, that event will feature our superintendent, and she'll be previewing what she's going to need in uh, her budget which will be FY20 beginning July 1st. You all know how important investing in our public education system is. I think everyone in this room knows it is the key economic development driver, period. Not just here, anywhere. Uh, and the Greater Salisbury Committee and Committee Foundation, United Way, and some of the other partners uh, will be active, again, in uh, ensuring that the leadership in this county recognizes the importance of investing in our public education system. And the 31st, we have our installation breakfast for new officers. Carrie Todd will be taking the uh, reins as the board chair. And that's here at the Civic Center at 8.30. I hope you'll come and support that. It'll be a fun morning. So we have two quick spotlight speakers I want to introduce. Uh, they'll go over what they do for a few minutes, and then we'll have our, our guest keynote with us. Um, our first uh, spotlight speaker is Ms. Natalie Bennett. She's representing One Year to Empowerment. Natalie? Thank you, Bill, and thank you, everyone, the, the chamber, for hosting us today. Um, we're just going to take just a few minutes. We're going to kick it old school. We don't have a, a, a 
slideshow, but we just want to take a few minutes of your time. Good afternoon. Here we sit on the eastern shore of Maryland. If you were a young girl, you might think, what is there to do around here? There are many reasons to be proud of being an Eastern Shore resident. Among the many things that make Eastern Shore special is the generosity and compassion within our community. There are many organizations doing great things for people on the shore. One of these groups is called One Year to Empowerment. My name is Natalie Bennett, and this is Jean Miller, and we are representing One Year to Empowerment. We are both program directors. Raise your hand if you have heard of One Year to Empowerment before. Oh, wonderful, <laughs> great. Well, for the ones who know and the ones who don't know, this is why we're here today. Um, One Year to Empowerment was created in 2014 by Dr. Samantha Scott. Uh, Dr. Scott, in her practice through the Child and Family Center, she has been seeing the growing need for an organization that would be designed to help with self-confidence, self-awareness, and most importantly, a program to empower local high school girls. One Year to Empowerment's mission is to provide adolescent girls with safe and meaningful activities that promote self-esteem, self-respect, and self-reliance, and to teach them valuable skills to lead happy, healthy, and balanced lives. So currently the group consists of high school girls from Wicomico, Worcester, Somerset, and Dorchester counties. Um, we, we, turn, we don't turn any girl away. So any girl that's interested in being in our program, they apply, they go through an application process, and once they're accepted into the program, then they become empowerees for an entire year. The girls participate in monthly events and also bi-weekly boutique nights. Some of the year's activities included aerial yoga, um, a Zen Wellness Studio in Berlin, a fencing workshop uh, hosted by Angela Herbert Hodges at the Salisbury Fencing Club, a self-defense workshop um, hosted by Officer Tina, Tina Russell from the Salisbury University Police Department, a wheelchair ramp, through, wheelchair ramp bill through Chesapeake Housing Mission, community gardening at the Camden Community Garden with Martin Hutchinson, how to change a tire and car maintenance skills at Jiffy Lube in West Ocean City, and just recently the Women Supporting Women Watch. And just last week, just the other day, the Ask for Kindness, uh, hosted by Grace Murdoch um, in downtown Salisbury. As Natalie said, in addition to the events, we do bi-weekly boutique nights. And some example of our boutique nights have included an etiquette class by Grace Murdoch, a cupcake decorating class led by Andrea Bursler, a college application and job resume writing class by Mary Holden of Junior Achievement, and last year, or last week, um, a CPR and first aid certification class by Jackie Carey. And we also recently just visited Warwick Community College where we had a wonderful tour where the girls learned about all of the opportunities and, and the little moments and ways they can get involved. We have two girls that already applied to Warwick because of the tour, so that was wonderful. All of these programs... <laughs> we'd love to come back every time. All of these programs would not be possible if it wasn't for the generosity of the community and the tremendous community support from several organizations, including some of you in the room, the Henson Foundation, the Donnie Williams Foundation, the Micomico Health Department, the Rotary, the Community Foundation, the United Way, and also the Salisbury Committee, Mike Dunn. The best part of all of this is that the One Year to Empowerment is free for empowerees for an entire year. And as a result, we have generous sponsors who choose to be an empowerees sponsor for an entire year. What's really great about being a sponsor? sponsor? Well, number one, for an entire year, you're changing, you're transforming a girl's life. In addition, the empowerees will write thank you and update letters to their sponsors throughout the year, and will, they are also invited to attend the annual Sponsor Appreciation Dinner. This is where empowerees spend the entire day cooking, decorating the Greater Salisbury Building Committee, uh, the second floor. And two years ago, the empowerees threw a multicultural dinner, and then this past year, the empowerees threw for their sponsors a luau. And um, it's a great way for the empowerees and the sponsors to get, get to know each other and to have a great time. In addition to the sponsors, we have two wonderful groups that are essential to the success of our program. They are our executive board and our board of ambassadors. 
The executive board meets four times a year to guide us, and our board of ambassador meets once a month to help plan fundraising and events. We are always looking for community members to join our group, so feel free. <laughs> Everybody, you're invited. <laughs> um, in addition to our um, going to our fifth year of our high school program, we're also launching a middle school program in 2019. If you know of any interested middle or high school girls, maybe your daughter, maybe your granddaughter, <coughs> maybe your niece, or just a mentor, someone that you mentor in the community, uh, please see Jean and I at our information table right there after the meeting. But the launch of a new program means that we're seeking community members that are interested in sponsoring a future empoweree event, an empoweree, a, a boutique, event, fundraiser, etc. Um, lastly, we would like to invite you, there's a couple pieces of literature that we left on the table. First is our Giving Tuesday Social. We're having that next Tuesday from 5 to 9 p.m. at the Brick Room. Um, we'll have information about our upcoming high school and middle school programs. We will also have guest bartenders, live music from Chris Daly, um, and we'll have light appetizers, guest bartenders, etc. Also, we have our um, monthly newsletter that we give you as well. And inside, you can see all of the different programs, what we've been up to the past couple of months. Um, and as you'll see here, we have all of our dates listed. Um, so if you're ever interested in joining us, we would love to have you for any of those events. Uh, one more thing to put on your calendar on Thursday, March 14th. We're going to be having a business after hours hosted by the Salisbury Chamber at the Greater Salisbury Building on the first floor. Uh, this this, at this after hours, we'll be launching our middle school program, so that'll be a great way to learn more about how you can get involved. So that'll be Thursday, March 14th. At this time, does anybody have any questions? Well, on behalf of Dr. Samantha Scott, Natalie, and myself, we thank you for your time, and please feel free to stop by and talk to us at our table. Thank and you very much. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. Our second uh, spotlight will be Eric Guy, Director of Community Partners for Bonanca Automotive Group. Eric, welcome.
But we wanted to find other organizations that have that pay it forward mindset and say, hey, thank you for also doing that as well. You know, basically a gift for givers. And um, what we do for those companies is we give all of their employees a no cost benefit. We say, hey, thank you for being a community partner and having those same values. We want to give all of your employees a, a benefit um, when they do business with us too. Okay? Uh, and basically, in addition to giving all the employees that, the company themselves get some name recognition. So I'm going to show you guys some, some people are in this room. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to show you know, some companies who will be advertising it through the chamber newsletter, making things public, so they get publicity. They get their name out there. They get to say, hey, company X is a community partner. And so just trying to create some awareness about that program so you guys, when you see it, you recognize what it's about. So if I am a, Dr. Warwick, is it okay? Oh, all right. So Warwick was one of our first community partners, um, and uh, all of their 800 employees get this benefit, whether they're a faculty member, a teacher, administrative. As a Marine, I, I know that it takes an entire um, organization for a doctor to be successful, for, for, for Dr. Hoare to be where he is. So it doesn't matter if they're part-time, full-time. If they're a member, they get this benefit when they shop with us. And the first one is they get an assigned sales ambassador. Um, so we have specific people at the dealerships that they get to deal with. A lot of times they deal with me first. So um, one of the maintenance workers at Warwick called me and, and I helped set him up. I said, hey, what are you interested in? Let me get you to the right people. I'm going to introduce you to the general manager of the dealership. I'm going to introduce you to the sales manager of Honda. And we're going to start you from there and work your way to a salesperson once we figure out what your needs are. Okay? And then when you figure out what you want, if you're buying new or you're leasing, we're going to give you invoice pricing on that vehicle. Okay? So for anybody that doesn't isn't familiar with invoice pricing, that is, it's not the sticker price, it's MSRP. That is exactly what we pay to have that vehicle put on the lot. Right? So if you're looking at a Toyota um, Camry and you, it's $35,000, we're going to give it to you for what we paid for that vehicle at our cost, not at the sticker price of the vehicle, just because you're community partner. How many of you love playing the game of negotiating your car price? Anybody? Oh, yeah, Ryan, I knew Ryan would read it. <laughs> the, uh, uh, thank you, Ryan. Uh, he, does, he does enjoy the game. The, uh, so, after you're done purchasing your car without having to worry about are you getting the best price for that vehicle as a community partner, um, the, you sit in the finance office. And when you sit in that office, they can pitch you about 100 things, and most times you walk in there going, I'm not going to buy any of it, right? And there's some really amazing, valuable things, and the three that are the most popular would be extended service contracts, and the nano paint protectants, and then gas. Yeah. Right? There's no margins on gap. So if you're a community partner, if you buy two of our most popular things, which is an extended service agreement, right? you want to do a five-year warranty or a seven-year warranty instead of the standard manufacturer warranty, then we'll give you $300 towards that. And if you want to get that paint protectant like I have so that I can be lazy and not wash my car and have my paint insured from any sort of damage, um, we're going to give you $300 towards that as well. So we're going to save you money on our most popular items in when you sit down with us. Then you have your car or, for example, Several of my community partners so far, they already have a vehicle. And whether they purchased it with Kohanka or not, they've decided they want to start servicing with us. And if they do, we're going to come to Warwick Community College, get their car, bring it in so that they don't have to miss class or do whatever it is their job is, their role, and we're going to service their vehicle for them. And we're going to give them 10% off of any of their manufacturer recommended services. So if you own a Honda and they say, hey, at $30,000, you should do this, and you do it, we're going to reward you for that. If you do four of those services, we're going to come out of pocket and we're going to wash and wax and detail your entire vehicle for free mm -hmm. on your fourth consecutive one of those details. So um, I, I really was excited to offer this to the people in the community that um, that I feel like deserve it. And these are just the partners that we've started this quarter. This program uh, launched in the mid of September and in the last two months. Um, these are some of the some of the partners that m many of them um, some of them are in the room as well. And there, there's more to this list, but this is just a start. And so my question for you guys today is, are, are you a partner? Do you, do you, is your organization, do you have this benefit? And, and if not, please please reach out. But do you guys have any any questions at all on what that program is? Had, had anybody heard of it? Because that's kind of why I'm here. Yeah, Dr. Lloyd, okay, it's Mike. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cool. So, um, you know, we want to start to extend, not just pay it forward, but for people to see um, the community partners. And I'm excited that we're the corporate sponsor for Giving Tuesday, and you'll get to actually see 
Pohanka Community Partners as the sponsor, not just Pohanka of Salisbury. So, anybody else? You know, any questions? Yeah, go ahead. Um, what, would you say you deal with the businesses that, that give back to the community, is there like a specific eligibility? Yeah, so, um, I, it is, we can't sustain this giving it to everyone in Salisbury, right? This is really to give back to the people that we want to. Um, that, that when I sit down with them, I usually get to know the business. So um, I just met with uh, Polar Engineering the other week, or HPI Energy. And when I sat down with them, uh, I get to know, sometimes I've already heard from the community, oh, um, you should go talk to so-and-so because they're doing this. And I, oh, they're sponsoring a ball team. And they're doing, they, they say volunteers start in all the time. It kind of puts a, that's how I, right now I'm targeting, is saying, oh, I've already heard that you guys are doing some things. Let me get to know your business better. And when they say, yeah, these are the things we do, this is what we do, we're put together this league, we've, we've done volunteers for this, we've been the donor for this, um, then that's how they qualify. That, that is essentially, they're showing that they're making a huge positive impact on, on the people around them. And they're doing things that maybe their companies don't have to do. And so, and, and for people like Community Foundation or United Way or, um, we're offering that freely to them. Anybody that we're already donating to, they're going to qualify. But this was to extend past the nonprofit to also both for profit as well to say thanks for what you guys do. Too. And we want to have a real partnership, not just have it for a Yeah? Anybody else? All right. Thank Aaron, you. Be here if you have questions. Yeah. Right here. Right here. Very special guest with us today. It's my pleasure to. Uh, to have Mary Beth Tongue with us. She was named by Governor Hogan as the Director of the Maryland Energy Administration in May of 2016. As Director of the MEA, Dr. Tongue works to ensure that Maryland's energy portfolio benefits Maryland residents, businesses, and local government by providing the effective use of all energy resources available in the state. Dr. Tongue oversees nearly 40 energy-related programs, including grants that benefit low to moderate income families, commercial and industrial entities, and residential. These programs also promote expansion of renewable energy and promotion of energy efficiency for businesses and nonprofit organizations. Speaking at a variety of conferences, Dr. Tucker serves as a spokesperson for Maryland representing the state at energy innovation conferences such as Light City Innovation, Microgrid 2.0, the Mid Atlantic Bioenergy Conference, and Wind Europe. She is Governor Hogan's alternate on the Southern States Energy Board, a commissioner on the Maryland Climate Change Commission, a member of the Maryland Clean Energy Board, and the University of Maryland Energy Innovation Institute Board, a member of the Maryland Smart Growth Subcabinet, a member of the TEDCO Maryland Innovation Initiative that provides seed money for new tech companies, and she's former chair of the Appalachian State's Low Level Radiation Waste Compact. Previously, Dr. Tung served as Deputy Secretary of Operations at the Maryland Department of Environment. In the role of MDE, she managed human resources, information technology, budget, procurement, and oversaw the facilities management functions of that agency. Mary Beth also helped develop innovative solutions for the department to work more efficiently and lead the department in emergency preparedness and radiation health efforts. She also oversaw the move of MEA to the MDE Baltimore headquarters and help coordinate energy programs statewide to assist MDE in reaching its environmental goals. Mary Beth earned her bachelor's degree in biology from the University of Cincinnati, a PhD in biomedical sciences from Wright State University, and a postdoctoral associate in pharmacology and neurology at the Yale University School of Medicine, and she received her JD from the University of Maryland Francis King Carey School of Law. She obviously is a member of the Maryland Bar. It's a great pleasure to have very good for this today. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Um, you didn't really have to read all of that. <laughs> you had to um, probably uh, catch your breath there for a second. Um, it just means I hung out in the classroom for a long time. And, um, good morning on this fine, sunny, wonderful, crisp November day. Well, at least it isn't here. Um, it was snowing pretty heavily where I left. There was a lot of ice and whatnot, but we got here safely and uh, the roads were, um, well, sort of cleared. So <clears throat> it was nice to get here and see rain. So actually for us, where, where I live, um, it was great to, um, to see the rain, actually. So I, I, most of you probably already know, but if you don't, John Fiastro is with us. He's uh, Director of Intergovernmental Affairs and uh, Legislative Affairs. And so he's with us today as well. So he's also, uh, will be available for questions as well. 
Um, before I start, I just wanted to say a few words about the speakers before us. First of all, Aaron, I bought my, um, it was about a month ago, <laughs> I bought my car at Pohanka in Virginia. Um, <laughs> so I was really happy with their service. So if it's anything, uh, if their service is anything like what you, you give, or if your service you give is anything like theirs, um, folks should be very happy going to your dealership and to your dealerships um, because um, I, I'll, I'll be back. Um, to Bohanka. Um, maybe I'll come over here. Um, and I wanted to mention uh, a little bit on one year to empowerment. For obvious reasons, I, I wind up um, being tapped uh, for um, women and girl empowerment programs. Um, I helped start a women in tech program in Harrow County um, and worked a little bit with the girls at Code and uh, STEM, girls STEM programs. And one thing I like about some of the stuff you're talking about is, is often girls programs tend to be um, programs that have girls working in areas where they're church traditionally male, which is fine, you know, um, obviously. I, many, many times I'm the, I'm the only woman in the whole room, so um, getting girls to think outside the traditional women's roles is, is important. But so is the, it, acknowledging that they're girls, <laughs> they're going to be women, and there's some things that girls and women like to do, like decorating Cupcakes. <laughs> you know, my husband likes to do that too, but that's, that's another story. Um, but um, so I, I like your program. It's a good mix. You know, um, I wouldn't let my kids out of the house uh, to drive on their own unless I knew how to change a tire. Um, and my father was the same way. Um, so I knew how to change a tire. I changed my coolant system back in the days when you could do that. Um, and I knew how to change oil. And, and one time my daughter was, um, she was shocked to find out I, I knew how to change oil. I said, well, why don't you change it yourself? She goes, well, you know, how am I supposed to do that? So I said, okay. She had never seen me change your oil because once I got married, my husband did it all the time. So I went out with her, you know, showed her what a, um, a filter wrench was and whatnot, and showed her how to change the, the oil in the car. And um, so she was kind of surprised by that. And it kind of made me feel bad because I realized all those skills that I used to do, we kind of got into our traditional roles, he did the car work, I did the housework, and so um, I like your program and that it kind of teaches the, the spectrum and let them know that there's a lot of um, other options out there for them. So, and CPR and first aid training is huge, huge. Um, as Bill said, I'm the uh, director of the Maryland Energy Administration. I've been here about two and a half years now, so hardly an expert, but um, I have learned a few things since I've been here. Um, and I, I've spoke, spoken with Bill on several occasions, and members of uh, Salisbury Chamber of Commerce um, in Annapolis, mm -hmm. I think, it's where we met. And so I really appreciate uh, the invitation to come out here. Um, and I appreciate the Chamber of Commerce organizing this event. Um, evidently you do it, what, on a monthly basis, I guess, to get everyone together. So um, you got your own group here, and that's, that's really cool. Um, <clears throat> I'm really pleased to be here uh, with you all today. Uh, to address your local community and business partners. Um, Maryland has benefited enormously, enormously from private and public partnerships, P3 partnerships. Um, they provide unique opportunities for residents, municipalities, and businesses alike. In this state, public and private sectors work together to grow, and we've got a lot of examples in our own program. Because we're just one week before Thanksgiving, my, uh, my communications director sent this, stuck this in the speech, and um, you know, I gotta, I gotta say it. Um, if you check our website, um, or particularly our Facebook page, she gives energy efficiency tips. That's a huge part of what we do is energy efficiency. And so it's the week before Thanksgiving, so every time you open that oven door to check on your turkey, um, your interior temperature can drop as much as 25 degrees, and that's energy going out into your, um, into your kitchen, uh, lost. So. Turn the light on, look through the little window, and if it's not cleaned off, make sure you clean it off before you do that turkey, right? Um, I need to go and do that myself. Um, but don't open the oven door, look at it, just look through. So, the, your energy efficiency tip for the day. Um, there's also, she's been running Friday um, dad jokes for at the RAG program, and, and those are pretty funny, and I've got a lot of folks who bad puns, puns basically. Um, I have a lot of folks on my Facebook list that like puns, so I get a lot of groans on her puns, but they, it, it's really cute. Um, so, on with our slideshow. This tells the mission of our agency 
And um, we are a very small agency. We're larger than some departments, but we're pretty small compared to everything we do. Um, we advocate for, uh, as Bill mentioned earlier, we advocate for the governor's position in the state of Maryland, uh, internationally and nationally. Um, and we also advise the governor and the General Assembly in energy matters. We um, represent the governor in the state of Maryland before the Public Service Commission. That takes up sometimes half our time. I think John, John's division helps with that as well. I think he, they take the lion's share of the PSC work, but um, different programs that come up before the PSC, we testify, and it really keeps us busy. Uh, major energy efficiency program in the state and power. Um, it can, if you look on your electric bill, there's a line item there for it. When you go and buy your uh, light bulbs, they're cheaper than you can buy them in Virginia because that's part of power. Um, so uh, that takes up a lot of time. We have a biannual report we get for PSC on that, so we actually have something assigned just to do in power. So that keeps us really busy. We also um, manage what's called the Strategic Energy Investment Fund. There's a lot of confusion about the Strategic Energy Investment Fund, which we also call SEEF, which is easier to pronounce. Um, the SEEF is funded through several sources. The first major source of funding is uh, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, or REGI. It's a nine-state consortium. It's a carbon cap-and-trade program, basically. So each producer of carbon, um, generator of electricity for carbon, uh, coal plants, gas plants, what, what have you, uh, pay per ton of uh, carbon dioxide into this REGI fund. Um, this year, the president for REGI, we're very fortunate for Maryland, the Maryland uh, Department of Environment Secretary, Secretary Grumbles, is the president of the organization this year. So it gives Maryland a little bit more voice in the organization than we've had in the past. Um, what happens is the funds come from all the states, it goes into a central fund, and then is redistributed to the states for energy efficiency renewable energy uh, projects. So I'm not a big fan of cap and trade programs, but this program, we know where the money's going. And we know that it's going uh, to try to make our air cleaner, which is the major goal of it, and to specific programs in each state that, um, allow for um, greater energy efficiency and renewable energy um, support in each state. Um, so most of our funding comes from REGI. Uh, Virginia and uh, New Jersey will be joining soon. So um, it is a market. So the prices go up and the prices go down. And uh, the prices have been down uh, considerably. As soon as I took over, the um, prices dropped to the floor almost. So I don't know if that was a signal to me or not, but they have been creeping back up. So we don't know what's going to happen when New Jersey and, and Virginia comes in because now those states are, are going to be able to uh, buy or, or participate in the auction. So um, our funding is dependent on what the price of the auction <laughs> is per, per unit. So um, that's part of our funding. Um, it had The legislature has a statutory formula we have to follow. 20% is for energy efficiency, 20% for renewable energy, and 10% for uh, administration, which basically pays our salaries uh, to administer all these programs. So um, we have other sources of funding from various mergers. Uh, we'll talk about one source of new source of funding we got from um, a merger, a gas company merger, um, and, and that went into a new fund for gas expansion. We've also gotten other um, Coke Point, I think, paid uh, a sizable amount to operate in Maryland. Again, that money went for, for specific things. And those are usually through the P Public Service Commission that will give the money to MEA for various programs. And each of those programs has strings attached. And so you have to keep track of where the money's going and that it's going for the correct thing. So we have several sources of funding. And um, so people think of the SEEP, anyone who's familiar with it, um, think that SEEP and REGI are the same thing, but they're not. We have other sources of funding as well. 50% of the money that comes from REGI does go for bill assistance. Um, a lot of people don't realize that. Um, REGI, for the most part, aren't very happy with that, but another state this year um, has even more going for bill assistance. So um, in cold winter months, you know, folks need to be able to pay their electric bill, and it's really hard to get the funding for that. So we do not get all the REGI proceeds. We do get it, but then 50% has to go to the Department of Human Services for their bill assistance programs. Maryland's energy landscape. Um, this is one thing that folks are not really familiar with. Um, we get 40% of our energy from outside the state. We import it. And when you import energy, it's usually more expensive. 
So that's one reason why our energy bills are a little bit higher, which is why we need to do more energy efficiency and renewable energy to, to take the prices down. Um, look at coal. People don't realize Maryland's a coal state. And while we do have coal plants that are retiring and being replaced by gas plants, we still have a sizable percentage of our in-state production is from coal. Did I have um, my SCT here? <coughs> Um, nuclear is 40%. That all comes uh, from the um, Cabra Cliffs plant. I will put a little comment in here. Um, thanks, John. Maryland, Maryland is part of the 17-state um, grid. It's run by the uh, organization called PJM. Um, they run the energy market as well. Energy is bought and sold on the market just like any other commodity. And uh, PJM is in charge of that. And they're also in charge of our grid, making sure our grid is stable. If you remember back in um, when New York City, um, in this, um, early 2000s, 2003, 2004, and they lost power, and there was power outages that went from Ohio all the way to um, New York, the value of, of uh, PJM came in, in full view there. It's the biggest organization that has a lot to do with every single aspect of your life almost that you don't know about. Um, they keep the lights on, and they kept the lights on then. They could see the power outages starting to translate down the various um, traps that were put in place to keep the power outage from spreading, was still spreading. They cut off from the grid and uh, maintained their own grid and cut off from all the exterior uh, grid and stopped it at the border. So that's why our power didn't go out. I think it's a dry year. <coughs> So PJM is kind of in charge of all of this. And even though 40% of our nuclear power comes from Caliber Cliffs, <coughs> there's a nuclear plant on the Pennsylvania uh, border. Does anybody have a call? I was actually just going to get you one. <laughs> I'm dry spot my throat right here. Um, <coughs> we also get power that comes in from out of the state, as I mentioned. And since we have a nuclear power plant just north of the Maryland border, uh, Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> Empowering girls. I'm going to speak. Um, we get power from Peach Bottom as well, um, even though it's across the border. So this is a really interesting um, petroleum uh, energy. That would be oil and um, uh, home heating oil and that kind of thing. Renewables, natural gas. Natural gas is growing. I suspect next year this chart will be a little bit different. So, one of the new programs we started in um, at, at MEA, there's a Maryland Gas Expansion Fund, and this is something that could directly impact you here in Eastern Shore. One of the reasons why it's very hard for uh, us to attract industry in the Western Maryland and also the Eastern Shore <coughs> is that energy cost. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you can't get a manufacturing firm to run off of propane, or some of them do diesel oil, but of course that doesn't help us on our air, air pollution uh, goals that work. But some of it is um, get internally driven. We like to breathe clean air, you know. <laughs> um, but also um, EPA. Uh, imposes a lot of requirements on us as well. And we are a non-attainment state for ozone, simply because we've got a lot of pollution coming from outside the state as well, some of the stuff that we've produced inside the state. So we have to try to get meet these clean air goals. So everything MEA does is to help um, MDE, the Department of the Environment, meet their clean air goals. So um, the gas expansion fund, natural gas, even though it's a... Um, a fossil fuel produces half of the carbon as coal plants and um, heating oil and that kind of thing. And um, it produces no uh, nitro, uh, what we call them, no noxins, noxins and toxins, no, um, no sulfur, no nitrogenous type um, um, compounds of the atmosphere. A lot of the bay pollution comes from the air. When the rain comes down, flows, pushes that stuff into the bay, coming down our tributaries and whatnot. So 
even though um, natural gas is fossil fuel. <coughs> MDE tells me they cannot meet their goals unless they have natural gas. So um, the get natural gas expansion fund, we're still putting the program together, but it will help um, entities that want to run gas lines up to their um, businesses. It may help uh, pay for gas mains that are going in, mostly on the distribution side, not the big gas mains that are coming in that would feed the entire regions of the state. <coughs> this money came from a merger between uh, Washington Gas and um, and the uh, Canadian company, Altigas. And we insisted on some of the money going outside the Washington Gas Service Area, which gave a lot of people heart attacks. But we, um, we looked at the law, and we, thought, and we looked at precedents where there have been other um, mergers that have sent money outside their service area. So um, the PSC agreed with us, and we have um, a $30 million gas expansion fund. Part of it will be used in the Washington Gas Service Area in underserved areas. Uh, not just Montgomery County and Prince George's, but all the way up into Fr Frederick. And then there is a portion of the money set aside for outside the service area, which is where you folks may come in. So um, it's going to be interesting to see what the final program looks like when it's released. Um, but we should be um, releasing that program, I'm hoping, within the next couple months uh, for public comment. So that's something that should affect this region directly. And I'm pretty proud of that. There's a couple of us that spent a lot of time putting that together. I was in the Amsterdam of a meeting, sitting on the side of bed at midnight, which of course is five o'clock this time over here, trying to put that settlement together. And um, <coughs> I'm really sorry about this call. So that's an exciting program that you'll be hearing more about. This is a, um, for those of you with solar um, interests, this is a tool that was put together by, um, I believe, yeah, PPRP. This is the Department of Natural Resources put this together. It was a collaborative effort. I kept um, lying and crying, which is what I do fairly well, and I went my way. Um, and uh, I do it nicely, of course. I said, look, developers don't know what the, we, we kept running into, well, this is a historical preservation area, this is an ag preservation area. It's like, well, developers don't know. If they're outside the state, they want to come in the state, and they want to follow our walls, and they want to uh, go along with what the community wants, how, how do they know there's no one place to put all that together? So this tool is really cool. Um, the green and the purple and so forth are transmission lines. Do we have the transmission to handle that 400 acre solar array? You might not have the transmission line available, particularly in rural areas. Um, is there farmland preservation? So if you click on, if you can zoom in and click on various areas in this map and, and it'll give you a listing of ordinances that would apply if it's a preservation area or whatever. <coughs> so this is a really cool, free to public, you can click into the, the site on the bottom, pprp.info slash smartdg, and it's a um, GIS uh, type uh, program that uh, is behind the scenes, and um, it's a really good first step for developers, at least they can look at it, it doesn't have all the information, the utilities didn't want us uh, posting um, all the details on the transmission lines for security reasons. So at least it gives them an idea of what problems they might come against and who they need to contact to try to get through those processes that they need to get through. Um, so we've quadrupled our solar since, um, since 2015. Um, I, as a rule of thumb, I always think of a major power plant being about 1,000 megawatts. So that's one power plant replaced by solar. Now, we do know that solar only works. If you have solar panels out, you're getting a little bit of power out here today, but not a lot. So this is its capacity if it was operating full time. But it does show you that there's real numbers here. Um, and we have retired some plants that we haven't had to replace. Our energy efficiency programs have um, probably stopped the, um, the construction of two power plants. And then the renewables are really making, starting to make a dent on how many power plants we need in Maryland to produce energy. And every one of those power plants, unless it's nuclear, is producing carbon and other pollutants. So this is really an amazing um, number. And we just got to this number recently. 
Um, Dr. Boyd can tell you um, our program director, David uh, Comas, is really, really knowledgeable. He's a nuclear engineer. Go figure. He always wanted to do solar. Go figure. Um, he's a, a veteran of the U.S. Navy. He was a um, nuclear submarine captain and um, the real nuclears, the uh, boom booms, the, the ones that carry the nuclear missiles. So very highly trained, one of the best in the Navy, and he's working for me. I don't get it. <laughs> and he is an amazing uh, person. So if there's any questions on siting or whatever, if you have any questions at all, please give him a call. <clears throat> I think he can pretty much plaster his uh, cubicle, and he's got a fairly good sized cubicle, with uh, customer service awards that he's gotten for, uh, and he just received a governor's citation a couple months ago in Montgomery County, he's a Montgomery County resident, um, for his uh, service to the community. So. Um, I think these numbers, to some extent, are because of him. And uh, Dr. Hoy can uh, attest to uh, how helpful he was in getting them through some of the issues they were having with their solar fields. So um, we have a solar parking canopy with uh, a requirement of electric vehicle charger. So the canopies, you've probably seen them, they're built over parking lots or parking garages. We have, I mean, I'm looking here and I see all the space, parking space. You can have a solar canopy there can be providing uh, power into this facility and um, have charging stations for the cars and uh, you have car covered parking. So you can go out and get in your car and not get wet. <laughs> or when the <clears throat> snow comes, um, your car will be covered in snow. Montgomery County just put a huge field in uh, that's providing between that and another project that I will talk about next, I think, the combined heat and power pretty much gives all the power that they need into their um, county offices and they're selling back to the grid. And they can also island themselves off in case of a power outage. So this is a really um, interesting program, but there's a lot of solar programs. Um, we have in our uh, commercial industrial program for smaller solar arrays you might want to put on the building or out in the field. So there's a lot of different uh, solar um, programs available. And we also have a homeowner a residential program as well to help with the cost of uh, installing on your roof. CHP. This stands for Combined Heat and Power. Um, the One of the projects we uh, put in about a year and a half ago, I guess, it's close to home, is Peninsula Medical Center. Uh, put in a, a very large combined heat and power program. Um, MEA um, gave them a grant of 494000 uh, They also got uh, grants from, I believe, Del Marva and, uh, and also from the company that helped put it in. Again, a public-private partnership going on. That system generates, get this, 26 million kilowatt hours of power. Provides a medical center with uh, uh, estimated annual cost savings of $415,000 a year. Um, what's unique about combined heat and power, it's, it's based on gas, again, requirement to get gas in. Um, but the heat, instead of going out as waste heat out of a smokestack, actually gets recycled back into the uh, center to be used for hot water. I, I think they're using it for their uh, washers and their dryers. And it can also, um, in the case of Montgomery County, I don't know if Peninsula is using it for this or not, it can be used for air conditioning. So they put them through an exchanger, and they, it can power air conditioning as well. This is real money. These, these systems can be 80 to 90 percent efficient versus a regular system that's 30, 35 at best. So these are really, um, they're expensive. They're basically an on-site power plant. And the neat thing that they were talking about, the governor actually came for the, um, for the dedication of the system. Um, Unison Energy is the owner and developer of the project. With support from White and Tur Turner, Rommel Electric, uh, Joseph Zimmer, Inc., and uh, Becker Morgan. And it will see a payback in just over seven years. So there was an initial cost, that's what MEA tries to help with that initial cost in the, in the sticker shock, um, so that these uh, projects can go in. One thing that they talked about is that if there's a power outage, they can island themselves off, again, like the Montgomery County system, 
And that way, when the electric company comes to power everybody up, they don't have to worry about that big load from the hospital. The hospital's already operating on its own until the, the electric grid is up and operating and, and going along hunky doors, and then they can hook back in. So a huge, huge uh, benefit to them. Half a million dollars a year. Um, so we've been putting these in 24-7 loads are good, prisons, hospitals, um, community centers uh, that are operating, uh, particularly if there's police uh, and fire departments in those community centers, so they're up with 24-7 operations. So it's a program I really like. Um, a lot of other people like it too, it's been so popular that we've just introduced a new called micro CHP or microchip uh, segment. It's for 60 kilowatt or less size projects. So these would be small commercial industrial projects. Many of you might uh, fit into that category. So let me know about that. That's a new program. We'll defray up to 50% of the total project costs. This isn't, a lot of our uh, programs provide the difference in a regular system and the energy efficient one. This one's 50% of the total project cost. So that's a huge cost savings. Commercial and industrial. We have a commercial industrial program, um, which of course the commercial industrial community has their own unique needs. Um, one of our, uh, and this is for renewable energy and energy efficient programs. One of our uh, commercial industrial grantees in Owens Mill um, was able to realize so many energy reduction savings that they were able to actually add a second shift on with the savings that they had from their, um, from their energy efficiency programs. This could be uh, lighting upgrades, could be CHP, could be solar panels, um, power management systems. Um, this is, uh, there's a lot of programs that can be, and we usually do a package. Because lighting upgrades, you can get a payback pretty quickly in lighting programs. You put that together with one that's a um, HVAC upgrade that could cost a little bit more, put it together as a package, make it a more manageable cost, and um, and that allow the payback in less than 10 years, which is what our requirements are. Um, Hamilton Associates performed a deep energy retrofit, are now saving 390 kilowatts of electricity annual savings, $51,000 in annual energy costs avoided. So this is real dollars. Uh, think of your business as uh, an ATM <laughs> that can be uh, used to uh, bring some real dollars into your organization. Maryland's top 10. We are top 10. There was a, an organization that was just there yesterday at a meeting in Atlanta. The um, ACAAA, the American Council for Energy Efficient Economy, they do a rating every single year on energy efficiency program. I only ups, I'm only upset over this because I think we should be higher. Um, but they rated Maryland in the top 10, uh, as number 10 on their list. Um, this is a coveted position. Uh, California, Massachusetts, I think, are fighting over first place. But um, we rate, we've ranked um, in the top 10, um, I think, in the last eight consecutive years. So uh, Maryland does a really good job on energy efficiency, but this is the single most cheapest way to um, prevent more power plants from having to be built, is energy efficiency. And there's so much more we can be doing. So um, I, I like to see this uh, ranking go up. But these are really great people. I was there yesterday on the electric vehicle uh, program. Uh, a lot of good ideas, smart minds in the room, smarter than me, on, on how to get more energy efficiency in, into a broader audience. Um, one of our um, programs, Data Center Energy Efficiency Grant um, Program, this program um, was a brainchild of one of our commercial and industrial um, program managers, uh, Roy Spangler. Um, he was working in the uh, CNI program, commercial industrial sector, and he noticed that the um, data energy center used so much power. And they were interested in coming into Maryland, but, geez, your energy costs are so high, we can't afford to come there. So they, uh, he started this program, and um, data centers have unique issues. First of all, they can never, ever be down even for a second. So their power supply, they have to have duplications, triplic triplicate, sometimes four ways of making sure their power doesn't go off. Um, 
They have hot sides and cold sides. If you've ever been into a data center or ever uh, in a uh, server room, the servers put out a whole bunch of heat. So they want to they want to keep that heat contained and not go into the cold side where the operating side is. Um, but they can't let the heat get too high. So they really have unique manage, uh, energy management um, needs. So we've been able to help quite a few of these uh, folks, energy management systems, new chillers, and that kind of thing, um, and curtains, putting curtains up to separate the hot side from the cold side. So um, he was just, uh, this program was just a, uh, awarded, or not awarded, they were nominated. There were 200 nominations, we were in the top four. Uh, for an international award by, I can't remember the name of the company now, or uh, the organization. Anyway, uh, the award uh, ceremony will be in London, and hopefully um, MEA will win the award for innovation and energy efficiency for data centers. So there you go, it's an award winning, international award winning uh, program. Another one of our uh, commercial industrial subgroups, I guess, uh, programs is our agriculture program. The agriculture program um, is called the Matthias Agriculture Program, uh, named after uh, Senator Matthias' wife. And um, the agriculture program uh, works, again, farmers have very, very unique issues as well. And we have a um, commercial industrial program manager, um, Dean Fisher, who works with the farmers. Um, particularly in this area, it's, it's a lot of chicken houses, um, but uh, we have dairy farms in the program and, and others. Um, the state's agriculture energy grant has saved Maryland farmers over $750,000 since 2012. And when you're operating a, you know, a farm, um, these kinds of savings, again, is more money. Um, we've also expanded our support of biofuels um, and we're currently growing the Animal Waste Energy Grant from $4 million to $6 million. And we're seeing more and more of these coming in. Europe's way ahead of us. Um, we're we're going to try to um, at least come up to the level of, of Europe. Um, and investing in the biofuels decreases greenhouse gas emissions, diverts pollutants from the Chesapeake Bay, and provides new revenue for farms. Um, so that's a program we're very proud of as well. Transportation. Um, I just mentioned electric vehicles. Uh, we also uh, provide support for um, alternative fuel, uh, fuel vehicles, um, com uh, compressed uh, gas, natural gas, natural gas uh, fuel vehicles. Um, over the past two years, the state's alternative fuel infrastructure program has helped to displace an estimated 10 million plus uh, gallons of petroleum products. Um, we also provide charging and fueling stations. So obviously a natural gas fueling station would be a little bit different than a gas station. Um, so we provide funding for um, compressed natural gas stations are interesting because they have to take the feed natural gas and compress it. Um, and so there's a whole plant involved in that. And uh, so those are very expensive and we help with the cost of that as well. And we also have uh, programs for electric charging vehicles as both the commercial and uh, for home uh, installation. So if you don't have the fueling stations, you can't have the alternative fuel vehicles. And we're currently working out the VW uh, plan, which is for medium and heavy vehicles. Um, the first draft went out to the public several months ago. We're working on some of the tweaks incorporating the public comments. Uh, the Department of Environment is a lead on that, but obviously um, Department of Transportation and Maryland Energy Administration are big, uh, have large roles in that as well. And that's it, if anyone has any uh, questions. Um, I just wanted to mention quickly, um, we also have the Maryland Start Smart Energy Community, City of Salisbury is a member. Kind of combines everything I've been talking about. Uh, there's three sections you can choose from, uh, energy efficiency, renewable energy, or uh, vehicles. Um, and I believe that um, Salisbury is using it for street lighting and install, installing solar panels. Um, and revamping some of the municipal uh, fleet. Hyattsville is an interesting, Prince George's County. They used the money to buy uh, two police motorcycles and a Chevy Bolt as a, not as a, just a police vehicle, but as a patrol car. So they had to trick it out because there's no um, market 
for um, police cruisers that have the lights and sirens and the whole nine yards. And um, they love it. They said they can come up behind perks and they don't even know they're there. <laughs> they, got, they got the drug dealers before the drug dealers even know that they're around. Um, and they're going around the state talking to the police department. So we were hoping that this uh, spreads um, statewide. A misperception of uh, electric vehicles are that they're slow and cumbersome, which doesn't help when you're behind the Prius trying to optimize their, you know, there's a little floating ball in there, and trying to optimize their um, gas efficiency, and uh, <laughs> they're going slow on the highway. But actually, electric engines are very fast. They respond very quickly. Um, so they're perfect, particularly high it's a little smaller community. Um, so we're hoping we can talk to some of the pol other police officers and, and police departments in the state. Uh, we're hoping at some point we can put together a program. It's one of my um, emphases over the next couple of years is to try to put together a program and some funding to go with it to help police departments um, convert or get at least one or two vehicles for their departments because it's, uh, again, it gives them vehicles that are really nice to use for police departments, um, but it also helps with uh, clean air. So, and I think all of them have their charging stations available to the public as well. And particularly in areas like Eastern Shore, the small rural areas, there's not as many charging stations. So that's a big deal. Um, North Beach on the Western Shore, um, they have right on their Main Street, um, they have their, um, their city charging station. So anyone in the city that has a car can plug in there. So um, that's all I have to say on my prepared remarks. I'm certainly happy to take any questions. Yes. Can you kind of give us an update on the impact offshore wind we'll have over here? Um, good question. Um, right now it's sort of in the hands of the developers and we are in communication with them as most of you are aware. Um, Orsted, which is a European company, um, has bought out um, Deepwater Wind, which was, uh, um, they were going to be developing the uh, Delaware, the one on Delaware Shore. Um, so that's still in flux. Um, they, both developers have moved offices into Maryland, um, so they're serious about what they want to do. Um, but right now, U.S. Wind um, has, they were supposed to be putting, I believe, a, a Met Tower in this year, and it didn't happen, so I don't know what's going on there. Um, deep, uh, deep Water Wind, or now Orsted, um, as far as we know, is on, on track uh, on their schedule. But, I mean, at this point, it's corporate decisions, and they're working with their supply chain. We're trying to provide trained workers. The, um, we have two programs for offshore wind. One is for business development. And that's, we require du dual use. So if a company applies for a grant, because there's a, there is a concern that, you know, once the towers are built, that these jobs will go away. So if we have jobs coming into Maryland, we want to keep them here um, and keep these folks employed. So we have dual use requirements. So we have a training program that we're, we're working with the uh, Department of uh, Labor licensing on, on that through their EARN program. Um, welding schools are very, very popular. We have a big one in Salisbury here that uh, was one of our first grantees, um, and they're doing a great job. Um, and, um, but they're getting people from Baltimore, so we've got a couple programs now open in Baltimore. Um, so that's one of the big ones is welding. And um, I think uh, Dr. Hoyt mentioned that at his school too. They've got a welding program. Um, I'm trying to think what the other big one is. Um, I can't remember right offhand. Um, but those folks are getting jobs at utilities and so forth before they even graduate in many cases. So for a job training program to be successful, we want to have jobs at the end. Um, on the other hand, if um, you know they come in and they want to build towers, they need somebody trained to do this, so we want to make sure our workforce is up to snuff, but that they have jobs in the meantime and will continue to have jobs um, during the development and afterwards. Um, but we, you know, as far as where we're at with it, you know, it's, it's primarily right now in the hands of the developers and they're not going to tell us a lot because, you know, they're right now in the process of working with their, their supply chain. Um, the other program we're working on uh, is a business development. It, again, it has to be dual use, so we've got some steel manufacturers and so forth, uh, steel fabricators and so forth who have been supporting, which already have built-in uh, customers, so they will continue operating in, in that regard. Um, and would be available for any work uh, that the developers would decide to tap them for um, in the offshore wind business once they start building. But other than that, I can't really give you any time frames because we're not getting them either. Is there any political 
blockage at this point? Like we see the, the billboards going up <coughs> that are competing, one saying you can't yeah. see the, the towers, the other saying we're trying to fight this. Is, is there an obstacle you foresee at this point that could keep this from moving forward? Uh, there is some opposition. I mean, I, I would have expected it. Um, I, I remember I was in my hometown, Cincinnati. I was driving down. There was a particularly scenic area. It's a beautiful area just outside of Cincinnati, crossing the Ohio River. It's a circle route around Cincinnati. Most people don't know that the eastern route is really rural. It's trees, and you know, you go across the river, and the Ohio River, you think of Cincinnati and buildings everywhere. And this is a really beautiful area. So we go down to the river, across the river at the bridge, and make a turn, and there's huge water tower. I mean, huge water towers in there. I'm like, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> so um, we expected opposition. We expected folks that were afraid of the view. But I look at that water tower and think, well, we all have views that are obstructed by various infrastructure, uh, telephone poles. I just happened to be looking at there's a Facebook page called, I think, Historic Baltimore. And was, they had this um, newspaper article, I don't remember what it was about, but I noticed in the corner was a little, there were citizens that were protesting City Hall because of the unsightly power lines that were going outside their houses, the distribution lines, you know, the telephone poles. <laughs> so this has been going on for a long time. So we expected to have um, opposition. It is going to be a change. And um, Ocean City in particular, they, they um, operate on tourism. And, um, so there are concerns there, and um, you know what the political obstacles may or may not be. I don't know. I'd be interested to see the dueling um, billboards. I wasn't aware that was going on. Uh, we've heard from both sides, and um, so our job as a state is to try to try to talk to everybody, try to get sides together, see what a happy medium is we can get there. Um, so far, it's worked. We've sort of navigated, but nothing's gone. St construction hasn't started on anything yet, so I expect that. Um, once construction starts, um, it's going to get a little worse. Um, but the PSC um, approved the offshore wind racks on the state, really, unless they bring power lines in the state, there's, there's no permitting because they're in federal waters. Um, so we try to work with the companies, let them know the local concerns. The locals have also been talking to the company. So uh, we're just trying to play mediator as, as best we can. But uh, the question, I wish I had a crystal ball um, as to how that's going to come out, but there's obviously, and you're aware of it, the uh, opposition, um, as well as folks that are for it. So um, we're in a listening mode right now from everybody. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I really don't have any, a good answer for that. Um, so when you showed us the energy breakdown of the pie chart of like 48% mm -hmm. coal and 40% nuclear, 7% gas, and we talked about the push towards natural gas mm -hmm. and then showing the um, the impact now that solar is having, like, what would you, what would, what would you love to see that look like ten years from now, as far as the spread on those percentages? That's a good question. Well, obviously, we'd like to see coal much smaller. Um, and and I'll, I'll do a caveat there. There are some plants, uh, coal plants, that operate very efficiently um, with no knocks and slacks. There's one in um, Western Maryland. I don't know if um, what's the name of that plant? Warrior. Um, Warrior and um, they have a different system. It's a fluidized bed combustion. They do produce CO2, though. Um, and so they're trying to figure out markets for CO2. Um, if the plants run their scrubbers, they're fairly effective. But again, if we have less coal, that would be really good. Um, so I would like to see that pie chart. Um, obviously, more renewables. Um, part of renewable right now includes the dam, uh, the Conwingo Dam, and it's got its own issues, but you know, I don't think anyone will argue the fact that it's not producing any air pollution. And it does produce about 10% of our in-state generation. So um, I would expect that pie chart to have more gas, um, a whole lot less coal. Uh, the nuclear is probably not going to change that much. Um, so it's going to be filled in probably with uh, you know, renewables as, as we see uh, real growth in renewables. Um, one thing that isn't really on that so much is the transportation sector, which is increasingly producing more and more of the pollution. The, the pie, the whole pie is getting smaller as far as pollution, but transportation is making up a, a much larger part of that. So uh, that pie doesn't really get into the transportation sector. So that's another one through the electric vehicles and the things that we're trying to um, focus on transportation. So that sector cuts down on that. So more gas, more renewables, I would think, and 
a lot less cold. But I really want to get crystal ball. <laughs> they haven't given it to me yet. I keep asking the government. They haven't given it to me. On that chart, 40% of the power was uh, was nuclear, and it's mm -hmm. it's provided by one plant here and, and right. a little bit from Peach Bottom in Pennsylvania. With that huge a percentage produced by that small, and we haven't had any issues with nuclear power plants mm -hmm. since the 60s, why is there no move to go forward with that type of renewable energy instead of solar and wind, etc.? Well, part of that, as you can imagine, is political. Um, our legislature is probably not um, too keen on nuclear. Um, we haven't brought it up because I don't think it's going to go anywhere. Um, but the other half of that is the states that have reached out to nuclear um, tends to be um, zero energy credits. So it would add to your electric bill. Um, so you would pay a certain amount of zero energy credits. It's like uh, renewable energy credits for your electric bill. Um, it would add to your electric bill. There's probably not a lot of stomach on either side of the aisle for that. Um, but in many states, I mean, you're right, this is something that we've, we've been discussing, not that there's anything in the hopper right now on it, but um, how do we go about um, making sure that that plant stays open and is supported? Right now, the cost of energy in Maryland is so high that Calvary Cliffs is in good shape. Um, they're, not in any, they're not even close to having any of the problems you're hearing in other states where plants are closing, that kind of thing. Um, because they can still sell their power into the market and make money. Um, the problem comes in if they can't, there's, I think it's through my home, hasn't been able to sell into the market for a profit in the last three years. Well, I mean, you know, you can do the math there. How much longer are they going to be able to make it unless they're given some support? We're not at that stage in Maryland, but we are keeping a very close eye on it. We're in very close communication with Exelon, who owns the plant. Um, and so far, so good on um, Calvert Cliff, but if we start seeing any signs that it's in trouble, we're going to have to have this hard conversation. But thankfully, we don't have to have right now. But we are keeping a really close eye on it. I've, I'm trying to get a tour put together for our group, and that's where really you go to the plant, you go through, you see what they do, and then they give you a really good breakdown at, while you're on the facility um, as to what they, you know, where they stand and what they're doing. So um, we're, we just keep an eye on it. Because, as you said, there is a very valuable source, not only of energy, but of uh, carbon-free. There's no carbon footprint from that plant. So, any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, Director. <laughs>